else depending on the size of the chamber. And this <coughs> is uh, an example picture from one of my experiment where the chamber width is roughly 60, um, uh, 60 microns. <coughs> so to study what happens when an amino acid oxytroph arises in a wild type population, I basically start with two monocultures where I uh, grow them in uh, M9 supplemented with uh, a carbon, in this case glucose, with methionine, which is the amino acid that the oxytroph cannot produce. And then I harvest them at mid-exponential phase because that's when the, um, the, the uh, wild type cells tend to leak most amount of amino acid. And I wash these cells thoroughly to get rid of the amino acids that are there in the extracellular environment. And then I mix them in a specific ratio. <coughs> And then I load them in the microfluidic device, and then I start imaging them. Um, and just as a control, after harvesting them, what we do is we also grow the monocultures of the wild type and the oxytroph, and the oxytroph basically cannot grow, <clears throat> whereas the wild type cells do grow, just in, in M9 supplemented with carbon. So this is a, an example video from one of my experiment to quickly remind you again, the pink cell is the oxytroph cell here, and the, and the, and the green cell is the wild type cell. And this is just half a chamber, not the, not the full chamber. <clears throat> and uh, so now I'll quickly talk about how we go from uh, transforming these, ima or, or from these images to more biological um, information. So I quickly want to acknowledge uh, Francisca, who um, is a data scientist, and she's developed the pipeline um, to look at uh, single cell growth rates. So this is a video from one of my experiment of a full microfluidic chamber. Uh, and this is basically different uh, uh, snippets, so images taken at different time points put together to make it into a movie. And what we can do is we can segment these images where the segmentation algorithm identify indi identifies individual cell. And then uh, we can track individual cells over uh, different frames. And what we can do is we can measure single cell growth rates. And then here, let's say each point represents a particular frame, and we can see how big a cell is growing over um, a given, let's say, period of time. <coughs> and now I'll discuss the main questions that I'm interested in testing and, and some of the findings that we, uh, we see for now. So the first question, of course, was to see if the oxytrophs grow faster than the wild type cells. And the reason why I expect to see this, so the pink cells are the oxytrophs and the green cells are the, are the wild type cells. And the reason why I expect to see this is because I was reading a lot about this black queen hypothesis and, and stuff where <clears throat> gene loss or genome streamlining can be potentially beneficial for a cell. Uh, and can uh, have a growth advantage. So I wanted to see, because the oxytroph lacks a big gene, yeah. Mm -hmm. So then if the pink is going to grow, it's going to be because the, the blue guys excrete methionine. Mm -hmm. And you expect that that's what's going to happen? Mm -hmm. Ah, because uh, I wouldn't have thought uh, yeah, so necessarily I, I, that that's ah, what's going to happen. Okay, so I, I said that in the beginning that these wild type cells uh, passively leak amino acids. And the only way that the pink guys would grow is because they're able to take up these amino acids leaked by the blue cells, and that's how they grow. And um, uh, however, um, what we end up seeing is that the oxytrophs tend to grow s roughly three times slower than the wild type cells. And I'll talk a bit more about why I think this is actually happening in, in, a, a, um, in, a, in a later slide. So just quickly to tell you, so I consider one microfluidic chamber as a unit of replication, and I've looked at about 1,900 cells um, across experiments. <clears throat> and the next question that I was interested in testing was to see how the growth rate of an oxytroph cell is influenced by fraction of oxytrophs in a local neighborhood. So for example, here you have an oxytroph, which is the pink cell that, are, that emerges. And this oxytroph grows and divides. And it forms a cluster eventually, because it's able to take up the amino acid that's leaked by the wild type cell that's in the neighborhood. And <clears throat> now let's say I'm interested in looking at this focal oxytroph cell. I'm interested in understanding how the growth of this oxytroph cell is dependent on fraction of other pink cells or other oxytrophs in that local neighborhood. 
and local neighborhood is here roughly uh, four to five cell lengths <coughs> from that cell. And here, uh, since the oxytroph is, is, the, is the taker and the wild type cell is the, is the giver, one would expect that with increase in fraction of uh, oxytroph neighbors in that local neighborhood, you would see that the growth rate of oxytroph decreases. And <coughs> this is exactly what we observe. So <coughs> um, for example, here I show that this is the, this is the local uh, microenvironment that I'm looking at, and that's the focal oxytroph cell. So what I, hear, what I do here is that I, I look at the growth rate of the oxytroph cell, and if the local microenvironment has less than 33% oxytrophs, I put it into the first bin, right? And if the local microenvironment has somewhere between 33 to 66% of oxytrophs, it goes to the second bin. And if it has more than 66% of oxytrophs, it goes to the third bin, right? And essentially what you see is that with increase in fraction of, uh, of oxytrophs in that neighborhood, you see that the growth rate of oxytroph decreases. And here, you can, on, on the left-hand side, you can see the, the, the cartoon of that, for example. <clears throat> and this is just, I'm, I'm just demonstrating this for one cell on the left, but essentially this has been done for all cells uh, across chambers, and, um, uh, and this, uh, this trend seems to prevail. <clears throat> and so, so essentially uh, here, what I think is happening is that these oxytrophs are, are like black holes where they're taking up the amino acid that's been leaked by the wild type. And uh, the more oxytrophs you have, the, the uh, uh, least beneficial it is for the, for the focal oxytroph that is there, let's say in the center somewhere. <clears throat> and the next question that I had was to, to look at the wild type cells and to understand how the growth rate of a wild type cell is influenced by fraction of oxytrophs in that local microenvironment. So even here, I fix the local neighborhood radius, and I look at a, at, a, at a wild type cell, the green cell, and I ask the same question. So how, many, how does the growth rate of the green cell depend on fraction of pink cells in that local neighborhood? And essentially, uh, even here, since what, what, I, what I would expect is that with increase in fraction of pink cells, which is the oxytrophs, I would expect that the growth rate of the wild type cells would decrease. And I'm, I'm sorry, why? Why in this case? Uh, yeah, uh, if you just give me, yeah, two minutes, I'll, I'll get to that. So even here, what we, what we see essentially is that when you look at the, um, um, the, the wild type cell and you look at a, a local neighborhood, I do the same, uh, set of same type of analysis here. So if the neighborhood has less than 33% of oxytrophs, the cell is binned into the first category. If it has uh, oxytrophs between 33 to 66% goes to the second bin, and if it has more than 66% of oxytrophs, a lot of oxytrophs in that local neighborhood, um, then it goes to the third bin. So even here you see that the growth rate tends to decrease with increase in fraction of oxytrophs in the local neighborhood. So, um, so these oxytrophs also tend to slow down the growth of wild type cells in the local neighborhood. Um, so what is happening? So what I think is happening is that these wild type cells are uh, inevitably leak amino acids as part of their metabolism. And these wild type cells and oxytrophs then try to take up the leaked amino acid, but the oxytrophs tend to be more efficient either because they have more transporters or because of the concentration gradient that they are facing. And they grow and divide, but they're not growing as fast as the wild type cells. So that means they're getting compensated, but they're not compensated at the right level that they're o able to overtake the, the wild type cells and, and, and grow. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Point three to point six and point mm -hmm. six to one. So are you controlling for the total number of cells in this neighborhood? Because one could imagine mm -hmm. that the, the denser your neighborhood is, the slower you grow. Mm -hmm. And so, but that might also, if you're a denser neighborhood, then it's also more likely there is more than so many percent pink ones. Mm -hmm. Right, so yeah. did you control for this? Yeah, so, so I also make sure that the, that the local density is the same. So as I was showing these movies before, these microfluidic chambers are always full. So cells are always packed. It's not like you know there's one particular place where there are fewer cells and there's another region where there are more cells. It's always uniformly distributed, more or less. Does that answer your question? Yeah, yeah, there is some variation in terms of orientation of cells, but then they're all packed. There's no empty space. 
Sorry, so since the chambers are all packed, like mm -hmm. you're sure that the nutrients that you're flowing in, the glucose you're flowing in the, let's say, in the, in the, in the channel is getting all the way to the end of the chamber, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks. Yeah, so, so we do uh, control experiments where, for example, we look at growth rates at different regions of the chamber. So on the top of the chamber and bottom of the chamber, different locations, and you see that there's no gr nutrient gradient, basically. Can I ask you another quick thing? Um, do you know how much methionine would they need to grow as fast as the wild type? Yeah, this is something that I'm testing right now where I, where I provide uh, methyl. So I just do batch culture experiments where I provide them with uh, Cas amino acids, mm -hmm. methionine, and see uh, how much I need to provide so that they grow as fast as the wild type. <clears throat> so to go back, so these, so they're being compensated, but they're not fully compensated that they're able to grow, uh, let's say, as fast as the wild type or even faster than the wild type. Um, and so these, my understanding is that these oxytrophs are a triple disadvantage. Um, so they are slow, first of all, to begin with, because they cannot produce methionine. Second of all, they are even slow when they are surrounded by more oxytrophs because these other oxytrophs are taking up or scavenging on these amino acids. And they also slow down their suppliers who are in the immediate neighborhood. So basically, uh, uh, this is why I think they are growing um, super slow. <clears throat> Um, so, so next, so next, what I want to do is is that I want to test the generality of this observation with amino acids that have different costs of production. So, methionine is a relatively expensive amino acid to produce produce for the cell. So, I would also like to work with other amino acids that are, let's say, less expensive to produce, like isoleucine or, or tryptophan. And I want to see if, if I, I, I see a similar um, um, result. Um, and with that, uh, I will quickly summarize what I uh, just told you about. So I see that in my system, methionine oxytrophs tend to grow roughly three times slower than the wild type cells. And oxytrophs tend to grow slower when they are surrounded by other oxytrophs. And it's beneficial to be surrounded by a wild type than an oxytroph. And wild type cells that are close to oxytrophs tend to grow slower than wild type cells that are far from oxytrophs. And uh, that brings me to the end. And uh, thank you so much for your, for your attention. And I'm, I'm happy to take questions. More questions? Thank you. That was very interesting. My only, like, the only thing that irks me a little bit is this fact that the wild type is releasing amino acids into the environment. Like, do you have any insight on why? They would do that because, I mean, my mm -hmm. idea would be that if I have something growing in glucose minimal medium, I take glucose, I make the amino acid that I need to make biomass, and that is it. Why would I ever want to actually release some of these amino acids that I need mm -hmm. into the environment? So do you have any insight into why this is happening? Mm -hmm. I think this is something that people are still trying to understand and don't fully understand why this is happening because it's a costly metabolite, and there's some evidence that it's not actively secreted, like it's not going through but also that these, these are uh, uh, fairly big and they cannot just pass through the membrane, so they're definitely going through the transporter, but they are, it's, it's a leaky, um, um, it's a leaky uh, thing, so I think that's what is going on there. And, and you have seen that there are amino acids Yes, yeah. Uh, we have done this, I, I have not measured the concentration, but what I do is I take the supernatant and I grow the oxytrophs on that, for example, and the oxytrophs tend to grow. And they don't grow when you just grow them in M9 supplemented with glucose. But so like, that means they excrete methionine, and then they need to re-import it in order to grow at their full growth rate? I'm not sure I understand. Because this is your explanation why the wild type is also slow, slow in the yeah. presence of oxytroph, yeah. right? So like, they sort of like excrete it and then try to re-import it mm -hmm. immediately. Yeah, so it's a That's leaky thing. Right? So yeah, so it's also something that I'm still trying to understand is that it's a leaky function, so it inevitably leaks no matter what the cell does. So it's away, it just goes out. So then the cell immediately tries to collect it back. Uh, this is my hypothesis, and then uh, because either because of concentration gradient or because of uh, more transporters, the oxytroph does a better job than the wild type. That's there. No, a, a similar question is, uh, methionine is, is essential for the blue ones, I believe? Or, uh, uh, the purple, blue, the blue one is, is metabolically independent, so it does not need methionine. It can produce its own methionine. The blue ones are the? Are the wild-type cells, yes. Oh, let's see. 
everything backward now. Ah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, I have a line, but I will go on. There's a lot of people. We have time. So do you think that the oxytrophs are just evolving randomly, or they're actually you're being selected? Is there a benefit to losing... Yeah, exactly. That's where I started, and, and that's, that was the idea, to actually look at selection in, in, uh, at single cell level to see if, you know, this is beneficial. And from what I have seen, it turns out that being an oxytroph is probably not so beneficial. Um, so I have a question. Maybe you said that and I just missed it. Um, about the methionine re-import, can you kind of elucidate about in which system this whole, or what the... the Reimport transport system of methionine looks like in the wild type, or the oxytroph, or I mean, preferentially both, I guess. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I'm still trying to understand that, so um, I'll tell you when I understand it better. And maybe as a follow-up question, do you can you see if you understand this better? Maybe an experimental approach to validate your hypotheses about the reimport of um, mm -hmm. methionine. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think one way would be to see if there's any way to quantify the number of transporters that transport methionine back in both cases and see um, if one has more than the other, or to maybe add fluorescent tags and see if um, uh, that helps, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think that my question is almost irrelevant right now because there have been so many answers, but I just want to put my five cents here is that if it's a passive leakage by diffusion only, then by locally decreasing the concentration of methionine, they will increase, increase the flux out of the cells. That, that will suffer, that will make the blue cells to produce, they will force them to produce more methionine, and that, that will slow down their growth. Of course, the only way to check it is to actually do the metabolomic study local metabolomic study where you will measure the concentration, but that's not feasible at all. Yeah, exactly. Yes, so I, I, I just wanted to say that, let's say, if I was a reviewer of your paper, mm -hmm. I would ask for some controls. Mm -hmm. to yeah. be really, like, add methionine to the system and show that it goes away. Mm -hmm. Or look for growth rates as a function of where you are in the channel. Mm -hmm. Because it's sort of difficult for me to really accept that you're making really important gradients in methionine mm -hmm. locally, but not in any of the other nutrients, mm -hmm. right? That seems, I mean, a priori a bit hard to swallow to me. Uh, okay. I think everywhere where, where, you know, there are more guys between you and where the nutrients come in, the mm -hmm. levels are gonna go down. And it's very hard to, to stop this. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so just to answer that, I have done a few of those controls where I grow them independently. So when I just grow the oxytroph, for example, the oxytroph does not grow at all in the chamber, and you see cell death eventually when you start imaging them uh, because it's, there's no methionine. Uh, and also when I grow wild-type cells, I see that they're able to grow even without methionine, and when I add methionine, they're able to grow. And also when I, let's say, um, supplement methionine in the, in the medium, I see that the, uh, that the oxytroph is also able to grow. So I've, I've done multiple controls, and I'm still doing more experiments, of course. You know, but, but you want to see that the negative effect goes away if there is mm -hmm. in the medium. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Uh, well, no, it, it's not a question. It's more a comment in general for all the people that have been doubting on the secretion of, of different nutrients. I think it's something very common in communities, given the heterogeneity in, in gene expression that can arise in a clonal population, I would think it's actually very common to see uh, the exchange of nutrients. Maybe not all of them are secreting methionine, but very different, and that's why it could affect that the fact that there are a lot of oxytrophs taking up the, the methionine could also not affect or force the cells to produce more, but it in general affects the, the local neighborhood by depleting that, that part of the neighborhood of that nutrient. So I don't, I don't think it's that hard to believe. Yeah. <laughs> um, this is very, very nice to see this happening. Uh, methionine seems a very sort of key component that is expensive. Mm -hmm. Do you see, um, 
density differences when you have like sort of when you mix them? It seems like uh, you get about 10% maybe oxytroph. When you increase that number, do you see eventually a shift in global population? Like in the wild type, does that also eventually, like how much oxytrophs do I need to sort of have an effect? Yeah, so I haven't done that experiment yet. And the idea was to recreate this scenario where, let's say, you have a wild type population and one or two mutants pop up. And the idea was to see if these mutants spread. And if they spread, what happens in different local microenvironments. So I haven't tried that yet. And that would be one of the controls that I would like to do eventually. So yeah, just a curiosity. Um, so your wild type uh, cells uh, passively leak uh, amino acids. Uh, I was just wondering if that's very common across uh, different strains in E. coli, or, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, it's, it's fairly common, and it has been documented a lot with uh, synthetic strains and also evolved strains that wild type, uh, that E. coli tends to, uh, E. coli wild type tends to leak uh, amino acids. And it's sufficient that it can also, uh, let's say, support an oxytroph, for example, to grow. And this has already been published by other groups. Okay, thanks. Yeah. One more question. If there are no more questions, let's thank the speaker.